Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Adam Thompson. I'm a, a weapon engineering officer in the Navy, so uh, a lieutenant currently, um, and I'm here today just to talk to you about sort of what options we've got, whether that's um, commissioned or non-commissioned. So whether you want to go to university or you don't, and the different routes we can we can sort of provide. Um, so it's a real uh, a real blend of everything. We'll talk about um, the different um, branches. Uh, so depending on what your interest is, and I'll sort of sprinkle it with bits of stuff that I've done um, and how what I've experienced. So it's not just a sort of theoretical talk about what the Navy does do, but some real kind of experiences in there as well. So, um, so kind of starting with a little bit to give you an idea of where I've gone through and what I've done. Um, I actually did a physics degree um, back in 2000, uh, 2009 finished in 2009 um, and I joined as a as an officer cadet in 2011 at Britannia Royal Naval College down in uh, in Dartmouth in Devon where all the officers do their training um, and on completion of that and the rest of my kind of engineering training I was a, a deputy weapon engineering officer for HMS Dartmouth operations in the Mediterranean um, and then when I'd finished there um, I moved to our our senior battle staff so uh, the short notice people who the short notice teams who are ready to deploy to support operations around the world and I was a deputy communications officer um, spent a lot of time working with NATO during that period, which was really interesting and seeing how the nations do things and, and that type of thing. And I was in charge of making sure that we could all talk to each other, um, that we knew how to email each other, that we could phone each other. We could do it uh, via sort of, uh, commu satellite communications or high frequency communications and every way that we could just talk to other ships that were going to be under our command. Um, and from there, because I, I, I got some good experience there, I went to the carrier strike group um, and I deployed to the to the states both in 2018 and 2019 to get them ready for their deployment last year so that was two trips to the states to um, get the f-35 fast jet up and running and ready uh, and make sure that we could um, take command of a, of a group of ships from the queen elizabeth uh, and again communications jobs so making sure i could talk to all the other ships around us and the americans if we needed to or the dutch or the french and get everything in place ready for last year's deployment which was a, a resounding success and now i'm here as a specialist recruiter to talk about life in the navy as an engineer um, we are we are really as engineers with the backbone of the navy there's more of us than there are any other branch um and we're in everything from you'll you'll come across engineers from everything from training at the very beginning of your career all the way through to policy and um, capa future capabilities current capabilities deployments um so we've got our fingers in every single pie so we're um, uh, we're a broad bunch of people so kind of uh, before we delve into what the job really is um it's best to put it in some perspective all of these roles require engineers um so this is why we're why we're sort of got we're into everything and you know what does it what do you see the navy doing when you read, read the papers or see the news um what do we do we protect the economy um so and um, we have people out in their uh, ships and out in the gulf that are are escorting um uh the tankers and the such like through the through the suez and places like that to make sure that all the stuff that we need to continue running as a country comes through by sea uh, and gets delivered to the uk so we're there to keep the uh, to keep the, the sea lanes open and make sure that all of the um uh, all of the the stuff that we're after it comes through and is safe and accessible we provide maritime security um so uh we're, we're making sure that our waters are safe that when the russians for example come down through the north sea or through the english channel we're the ones that are there to meet them and escort them on out out of our territory and move them on towards wherever they're going uh, we provide humanitarian assistance so um the, Ca the caribbean for example is a place where that happens a lot when there's hurricanes we go and we deliver stores we go and fix stuff so our marine engineers who are experts in in power and propulsion will um deploy uh, generators to go and get critical infrastructure like hospitals and and those sorts of um, government services up and running so they can start to treat the sick and the wounded and um, we as weapon engineers we're in charge of communications so we'll go and fix um, phone masks uh, make sure there's phone towers running so that that once they've got their buildings back and running, they can coordinate efforts to provide healthcare and, and other such uh, important services at the time. Um, so we're involved. Our air engineers make sure our helicopters run so we can get uh, uh, equipment ashore so we can support all of these activities. So I uh, said engineers are really key to all of this. And um, we also promote partnerships. So um, that there is the is the Queen Elizabeth when she was brand new, alongside the George Bush when she was over here preparing, ready to go into the uh, into the Mediterranean and on into the into the Gulf. Um, they did a joint a joint exercise with the UK US, um, and that was a really really sort of first testing time for the Queen Elizabeth. Um, so again, working with our allies, working with our um, with NATO and with other other partners that um, that allow you to force multiply. We're here to prevent conflict as well. That's a NATO, standing NATO maritime group there. It's a lot of ships um, uh, and it's to make sure that all those guys can operate and girls can operate together, know what they're doing, even across language barriers. Um, and we're there to um, to prevent conflict uh, and know that we're, we're, we're a well-trained ready to go force if we need to. And the main thing, you know, that, that everyone knows that what we do is we're always ready to fight. As a weapon engineer, for example, my role is to make sure that 
all the sensors, all the weapon systems um, on board are, are up and running and are available to the command should they need them. So there's two kind of routes you can take um, for, for what, if you want to be an engineer. Um, I'm very much on the, the officer side. Um, I said I did a degree. I'm a project leader, I'm a project manager. My work is very much about taking all the specialists who are expert, experts at fixing and, and maintaining their equipment and ensuring that we can meet the aim that the command require. So that's a lot of leadership early on. That's um, driving and motivating um, the, the team around you, being able to communicate well uh, and understand the bigger picture and how to reach that final sort of bigger picture goal. If you want to be really hands on, you want to be you know elbow deep in cabinets, fixing things and, and be a specialist, a real specialist in some of those areas, um, then the rating route is for you. Um, and you'll be hands on with the equipment. Um, you'll be you will be the go to person. I will come to you and say, right, what's wrong with this? What are we doing? How do we fix it? What do we need? Um, and then you'll be solving complex technical problems and providing advice and the guidance to me on how we're going to achieve that. And then I'll be going away to help make it work. So um, it really depends on which side of the fence you want to fall. Um, I, I like the side that I do because I'm not really that hands on, but I like the fact that I have a wider understanding of what's going on um, and how to deliver it. Um, and then my my ratings are, are experts in what they do and, they, and they, they really come through every time. So what sort of careers, um, where do we do these in? What sort of careers do we do these in? Marine engineer, um, uh, the air engineers, and weapon engineers, and we'll talk a little bit more about each one. So the marine engineer is very much mechanical engineering based. Um, they're looking after like our gas turbines, they're looking after our um, diesel generators, They've got power and propulsion, they've got all our high pressure salt water systems. If you're on a, if you're on a submarine, they've got a nuclear reactor to look after. Um, and their entire job is to make sure the ship or submarine can move, it can float, um, and it is safe to be on board. Um, they make sure we've got all of our firefighting systems, they're damage control experts. Um, they make sure that we've got everything from um, ventilation and sanitation systems and hot water right through to the uh, make sure that the ship is, is able to float, is able to move um, and has power. So they will provide power to people like me who would look after the weapon systems that we then provide to the operators. So it's a really, it's a really close knit role. So as weapon engineers are kind of alluded to there, we're kind of the, the, um, the war fighting element um, for the operations team. We've got the eyes, ears and teeth, as it's called. So we've got all the weapons and the sensors and the communications, everything we need to turn that ship that the marine engineers are, 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 are maintaining for us into a, um, into a warship. Um, and we've kind of adopted defensive cyber recently as well because we own all the IT networks and all the computer networks. Um, uh, and we tend to focus much more on kind of the electrical, electronic or communications areas where the and computer science as well, where the MEs are much more mechanical engineering based. And our aircraft engineers, um, probably quite obvious, does what it says on the tin, and they look after our aircraft. So uh, they work with the um, fast fast jets from RF Marham um, that we've got that are based on the Queen Elizabeth most of the time um, and they've got also got helicopters at um, Yeovilton which is just near Yeovil in Somerset and at Caldrose down in um, Cornwall so um, they'll typically deploy onto things like the Queen Elizabeth carriers the uh, landing platform docks with the commando helicopter force when we put Royal Marines ashore somewhere and they also go out on the RFA vessels um, to support the flights that are embarked on those so they tend to mostly tend to be focused around sort of aeronautical engineering degrees um, and that goes back to the point that I said earlier that we're very much project managers and people managers. We're less hands on. We have to understand the systems, understand the the engineering. But um, we've got the guys and girls below us who are who are experts in what they do. So we let them look after the equipment itself, and then they brief us as they need to. So um, that's kind of the three flavors. So you, you can you can cross cut that however you want. Um, pick a role that maybe uh, you like the sound of, whether it's marine, weapon, or air, and then decide whether you like the idea of being hands on, whether you like the idea of being in charge of people who are hands-on and that's that's really the way you best way to cut it and the thing that i always try and get across to everyone when i do this is that everyone assumes that we're at sea 365 days a year you know for every year we're in the navy it's really not true about 90 odd percent of the engineers maybe more are not at sea um for most of the time as i said uh, or alluded to at the beginning we kind of have our fingers in every pie so um we're, we're really not not just spending all our time floating around fixing stuff on chips um, if you're not doing operations, um, which is kind of on the on the top left there, if you're not doing operations on uh, on a ship, you could be doing an op tour abroad somewhere, such as the Middle East, or you could be deployed elsewhere with um, maybe with other units like the Army or with the Air Force or with a NATO nation. Um, capability and acquisition is a huge one for us, uh, which is based in Bristol at our um, at our major logistics and engineering hub. Um, and we're there to um, to kind of look at future capabilities. So when we design the next air defender, 
we can help to write the contracts for what sort of equipment do we want on it? How do what do we want the radar to do? What do we want the missiles to do? And then give and then work with industry to try and help design those those principles, uh, and then come away with some ideas of what what they could give us and uh, and see how we can design the best possible um, air defender we've got in our within our um, budget and and, and capabilities. Um, we also do in service now, so when the um, when all the kit stops working on a ship and they can't work it out, they give us a ring and we go, okay guys, we'll talk to the people next to us who uh, who, who built it, uh, and we'll get back to you and you provide like another layer of support so you can really help. And those ships that are that are struggling at sea, um, if they have an issue, and that's a quite an in-depth job, and it's really rewarding because you'll really go away to the books. You'll sit down with the guys next to you, and you'll you'll try and fault find them and help solve these problems. So um, it's very rewarding when you can when you can give good advice to to a ship and help it solve a problem it couldn't solve on its own. Uh, we do things like um, personnel. This is a personnel job for me now, so someone has to look after the sailors. Um, I'm a recruiter at the moment, but we have um, we have people in. Um, uh, in, in Portsmouth, who look after the careers of all of the all of the sailors, they know where they're going next, what their next job will be, um, when they what they want to do to get promoted, how you balance out their home life, and try and make sure they have a, a well lived experience in the navy. Um, and you can also look after the future of your of the branches as well. So, how, what is the weapon engineering branch going to look like in five, 10, 15 years? How do we shape that? That's very or people orientated sort of role, and some people really like that. Um, and training, you know, you can take your knowledge that you've learned over how many years you've been and impart that back to. Um, back to new uh, ratings or new officers or new engineers um, at your sort of different fa phases of different training places. So you can shape them into what you think is the future of what the Navy requires. Um, and, and if you want to do something different, you know, you can get loaned abroad to other navies. Um, there's other jobs, whether you're in a naval uniform or whether you're in a, a different uniform, um, you can go abroad to do postings in, the, in America. You know, there's jobs with France, with NATO, with, with Canada, um, all sorts of different places. So uh, I really hope well, what you take away from this this slide, you don't need to remember everything I've just said, but just really understand that a life as an engineer is not running around with a screwdriver on board a ship for however many years you're in. Um, there's all these different things that we have to move through to understand how the whole thing works. So it's a real, um, really broad um, uh, job that every couple of years when you start something different, um, you try and challenge a different bit of your brain. So um, it means I don't, I've got quite a short attention span. So it means that I don't get bored too quickly because um, I know that in two years I'll be doing something really different. And just some examples of um, of kind of some of the things that I've done um, uh, instead of it all being theoretical. Yeah, the top left there is me doing some, some of my training, uh, learning how to how to inspect a minigun. Because as the as the one of the engineer officers on board, my role is um, part of my role is to make sure that the art standards are being upheld. So I'll go around and do routine inspections on the equipment um, and actually doing a bit of training to understand how a minigun should look, what looks good about it, what looks bad about it. You know, it's on the edge of a ship. It's exposed to uh, to sea air all the time. So salt ingress or water ingress or, or rust could be an issue. So it's just making sure that everything that needs to be taped up or greased up is done, um, making sure it's it's clean, it's tidy, um, it's been stowed properly, any ammunition has been taken away, that sort of thing. Um, and part of the big things about what we do is not just about the job, it's about the time out and around it. Um, and it's about personal development and it's about team building, team development. Um, and at the top right there is, is we went, we had a paintball day because the department had, had a lot of changes and had a busy time. And we kind of needed to get everyone back together and just reset a little bit and uh, get to know each other in a bit more of a, a social environment. So we went paintballing on the road from the dockyard uh, and had a fantastic day um, out there. And you could work out who liked who because you could work out who had the most paint marks on them by the end. Um, so you work out who the popular people were because they were, they were generally a lot cleaner. Uh, and the bottom left, um, we were we were affiliated to Jaguar Land Rover, and they invited us to our, their challenge weekend, which is up in Wales. And we had a weekend of doing different challenges, along with uh, about another fifty or sixty teams they invited from across industry. Um, so we were out hill walking, mountain biking, solving puzzles, um, all sorts of stuff to try and gain points and then and then win a trophy. Then unfortunately we didn't win, but it was a fantastic weekend uh, just in and around the company and some of the other other industries that were there and share a bit of experience of what we've done and what we've been through. Um, so it was a, it was a it was a fantastic time away from work and, and we thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, and finally, you know, I went out to watch uh, the America's Cup, the sailing from Portsmouth when it was held down there, uh, and that was a nice afternoon away from work on the deck of Montrose. Um, so you know, it's not just all about the work; it's about time where where you get to visit other things and see other things and, and speak to you know speak to different people um, and have some experiences that when you walk away later in life, you go, "Yeah, I'm really glad I did that. It was really impressive." Um, and a few more from my last couple of years, you know, I, one of my sort of highlights of my career so far was taking the, the Queen Elizabeth for her first deployments to the States um, when I was part of the carrier strike group. 
we went into New York, you know, doing doing ceremony into New York and seeing Manhattan uh, in the morning when you when you get up uh, and have your cup of tea before you go to work is a fantastic view. Uh, a colleague and myself there in the top right, we went we went and did a half marathon that was being run locally that the ship sent the team. Um, it didn't have to be. I'm I'm not the world's fastest runner. Uh, I'm quite tall, quite heavy, so I'm not quick. Um, but the, the the Canadian countryside was phenomenal, and I, it's not often you get to go and run something like that somewhere else. So we went and did a little run around Canada, a um, small part of Canada anyway. Uh, and then with a bit of downtime, um, some of us, uh, as you see in the bottom left, took a few days to go down to Orlando. So we were based in Florida, we're based near Jacksonville. It's about a three hour drive to Orlando. So we went down and did Universal Studios and, and MGM and that sort of thing. Um, and it was fantastic, you know, just three days away from work. Uh, it didn't cost a plane flight because we were already there. Um, and we just took some time off and went down for a visit. And finally, you know, one of the things, it's not all work at sea. Um, we had to, we were going across the Atlantic in 2018 and it was flat, it was amazing. Weather was fantastic. So. They got the um, the big screen out. They got a like thirty foot inflatable screen. Had a barbecue on the go, and we watched Top Gun, which probably probably the most um, appropriate film for the flight deck of a of an aircraft carrier. Um, but it was a it was a it was a fantastic night. So and that's about social social bonding as well with your team. And with the guys, everyone works hard when they need to. Um, but if you need a bit of downtime, then it's always worth it. It resets morale because they want a bit more of a boost. Um, and then you attack everything again the next day. So um, we do sports days on there. We do sort of horse racing nights. We do um, all sorts of different competitions. There might be talent shows. There might be entertainment. Um, and it just gets people out of their offices, out of their cabins and up to speak to everyone else. They might not normally speak to you because you might work on a completely different end of the ship and you get to go and have a chat with someone you don't normally speak to. So it's a fantastic way to socialise. Um, and kind of the depending on, on what you want to do really depends on how the um how the how the career structure pans out whether you want to sort of go the rating route or the um or the officer route i won't go too much into the into the details and things like the pay and stuff because that's all on the website and that will all constantly be updated to make sure it stays up to date but the things that i really like to focus on with this is how we um is the stuff that goes on outside of work so like i've kind of alluded to already it's not just about the job. The job is great. The job is varied. Um, and I do a lot of stuff that my civilian friends don't do um, uh, that I like to tell them about. But it's the things like you, know, you get your free health care, you get your free dental care, gym facilities. Yeah. But but everything is everything is driven towards your personal development, towards your team development. Um, but there's opportunities for things like further degrees. I'm doing a, I'm doing a master's in cyber defense at the moment that the Navy's paying for, which is great. But really, it's about getting out and doing adventurous training and sporting activities. You know, we get two weeks a year to go and do some adventurous training. Um, I, I really, really like it. Um, I'm trying to go kayaking later this year. I've just got to fit it in around my diary. But it's not holiday. It's all paid for. Um, it's really just there to allow us to, uh, to, to, uh, to get to some time away and just, just do something a bit different and maybe... You challenge yourself at work, but to do something a bit physical, a bit different, um, you can go skydiving, you know, you can go, what else have people done? Mountain biking, hill walking, rock climbing, sea, uh, diving, um, scuba diving, you know, people have done everything. So, uh, and you can do it alongside the army or the air force, depending who's hosting the event. Uh, and sports, if you're really into sports in any form, you don't have to be, you don't have to be really good at it. There's everything from sort of grassroots level with your, um, with your friends um, on a Saturday, on a, sorry, Wednesday afternoon, you know, on your base or with your ship right up to armed forces level where you can compete um on a regular basis uh, at the highest possible level you know, we've had a few uh, olympians for example who pretty much disappeared for eight years and when they did when and trained for olympics instead of doing their job um we've had a couple in the uh in the winter olympics one was a guide for a for a blind skier one was a bobsledder and then yeah pete reed who was a rower did a couple of olympics the last couple of olympics as a um as a rower so he didn't he didn't really do a lot of work for most of his time he was out training to row so um there's, there's loads of options to do but you don't have to be at an elite level um i i go uh rowing as well but i do what's called um big rowing which is like big wooden boats i don't know wednesday afternoon with a few guys it's good fun people play football people play hockey it doesn't really matter um you know if it is something that you want to consider going forward for and you want to say go the officer route and want to go to university there are bursary options available it's just all on the website depends on what you're interested in doing um uh, and it's a broad kind of um it's a broad kind of job really uh, and that thing i try to try to get across is is try and put those points that we're not all see all the time jobs are heavily based in and around the country um and mostly land-based for 90 percent of us at any one time um that every sort of day or every every day every couple of days every week is different um yeah i'm doing this tonight i'll be doing something different tomorrow i'm off to an event in bristol tomorrow so it's all a bit different um and that 
and that it really is what you make of it. Uh, there's loads there for you. The Navy will give you loads of stuff to do. Um, and the more you ask for, the more you can get. So if you're if you're a bit like me and you eventually wonder about what you want to do for for sort of a few decades of your life and you don't fancy doing the same thing all the time, this is this is the place I've kind of headed. Uh, and I've been in 10 years now and I'd honestly go back and do the whole thing again. Um, I think it's brilliant. Um, so kind of depending on what you need to um, what you need to join. Um, for the officers, it goes up, as I said earlier, goes up to degree level. So if you want to go to university, you want to kind of do mechanical, electrical, aeronautical engineering, then you're in that kind of bracket. And that's the man manager, project manager, people manager type role thing. Um, if you're more interested in being hands on and, and, and doing kind of um, hands on engineering and getting deep into the equipment and being very technical, then uh, the accelerated apprentice route is probably the is the kind of next one down, which is UCAS points. But if you don't want to be an accelerated apprentice, which is just a slightly faster training route because you've done some UCAS points. If you just want to do, just want to join as a technician and start from the beginning, and then it's just 16 once you've once you've finished your finished your GCC. So um, there's that's all on the website. I say just Google or search for Royal Navy Engineering Officer or, or Apprentice or even an engineering technician and it'll come through. So um, yeah, that's that's got the criteria and the age limit you see there is fairly broad. So plenty of time to think about it for everyone. Um, this is kind of my uh, uh, my two pence for a, set, for a sense of what I've kind of picked up over the last 10 years. Um, for me as an engineering officer, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a leader first, I'm a I'm a people person first, and then I'm, I'm an engineer second, as long as my team is doing its job right, um, and it's, it's happy, they're developing, they're healthy, then that's good. The engineering bit for me then comes second. Um, as I've already stated, you know, it's a very broad career. There's always always a challenge, always something new you can try and get your hands on. Um, and the Navy wants you to wants you to develop, wants you to improve, because if you don't improve, you get stagnant. Um, and it's all about being something new. Uh, and being able to communicate, you know, and, and analyze things is important. You need to be able to do that on the fly at times. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's a skill you learn as you go. Um, no one no one does it from day one straight away. You just you just get the hang of, of considering things, turning them around in your head, looking at them from a different angle and and, and bringing out a question or two. Um, and that drives you kind of thirst for improvement. Um, and as I said, generally wouldn't find it, wouldn't choose anything else to do. Um, and that's uh, my, my predecessor had a quote, he had a different quote, but I didn't really like it, but I like this one um, because you do lots of work on leadership uh, about understanding leadership, understanding management. Um, and there's no real answer. So you kind of find what works for you. Uh, and I have found that that's the one that I like because there's very different people. People lead in very different ways. I'm not a shouty person. I'm not a sort of uh, in-your-face person. Um, I'm kind of the sort of come with me type person. You know, well, well, let's get this done. Uh, and therefore, I, I've always liked Eisenhower's quote of that: leadership is the art of getting someone else to do something that you want done because he wants to do it. Um, which means that to me means that if I can gain the trust of my people and they want to work for me and they want to do the jobs I want them to do, then they'll do it a lot better than if if I'm if I'm trying to make them do it. So. Um, you find your own sort of groove, you find your way of doing things. There's more than one way of doing everything in life. Uh, and then you, you you kind of go down that route and take that with you. And you develop that as yourself. You become aware of who you are and how you operate. So um, that's kind of my sort of two pence at the very end. You'll find your own routes in life and you'll find your own ways. You might think you completely disagree, but uh, that's, kind of, that's kind of how I do things. And that's probably the, the bulk of it, really. And I'm open to as many questions as you'd like. Yep, so we've just got two in at the moment. So if there's any questions, just keep them coming in um, and I'll ask them and Adam will answer them. Um, first one up at the top, a uh, question about asthma and then joining up. What is that with the Royal Navy? How? Uh, so there is some limitations on asthma, but it very much depends on when you had it, how long you had it, if you've had any sort of steroidal treatment. I don't, so I don't know your circumstances. And I, I'm not a medic, so I don't know the full answer. The best thing to do is just speak to your careers office and ask the question because they'll be able to speak to the medical cell and, and get you an answer fairly quickly. So if you just just put your uh, sort of find your nearest careers office into into Google or have a look on the website there, they'll um, they'll be able to answer that for you. It's quite unique to each to each person really. Well, uh, someone's asked about a commando engineer. Do you know anything about that? Uh, so for the Royal Marines, the majority of their engineering, heavy engineering, is done by the Army, by the Royal Engineers. So if you want to work alongside the, the Royal Marines as a as a as an engineer, the majority of that is done by Royal, uh, Royal Engineers Commander Regiment. So they join the Army, then they do the All Arms Commander course to, to become a Royal Army, uh, to be, sorry, to become an Army Commando. That said, 
Um, we have things like um, the communication information systems branch who do all the, the all the uh, communications engineering for the for the Royal Marines uh, and for and for the uh, for Paul at Special Boat Service as well at Paul. So if you're interested in in kind of uh, maybe more electrical engineering and communication side of it, radios and that sort of thing, then the CIS branch, and then look to go down and do your all arms commando course would be the would be the way that would get you in that way as well. Well, uh, next one. Um, I think it's just a clarification. Can you go back over the ages to join? Yeah, sure. Um, so pretty much, um, if you will start at the lowest, the sort of the, the earliest entry level is 16 for an engineering technician, which isn't on there. Um, uh, but that, that's just an engineering technician and doesn't really require you to have any any qualifications, but you obviously need to be 16 because you need to finish your, finish your GCCs um, and they'll teach you everything you need to know from the, from the base level up. The accelerated apprentices um, are those that have done sort of two more years of college of some form. So they might have done UCAS points via A-levels or via BTEC. Uh, and then you're able to um, to join as an accelerated apprentice where you start as a leading hand, which is the next rank up from the technician. So you're a junior, you're a junior sort of manager from day one, junior leader from day one. You're paid a bit more money um, and your, your training is accelerated because you've uh, done a bit more study at school. And then the last one, and that's 17 to 25. Um, and then your last one is engineering officer. If you go and do a degree, um, in mechanical, electrical, aeronautical engineering, primarily, uh, you've got up till 39 to join, which is, is a lot older than people think. Well, um, another one, I think this one's going to go back to the AFCO, uh, is the, are there any restrictions in wearing glasses? Uh, so there, there aren't, you can wear glasses, that's fine. Um, we have a lot of people who have glasses and contact lenses, that's not a problem. I don't know how far down the scale in terms of how much you need, how, how limited your vision is will be the difference. Um, again, it'll be an AFCO question because I'm not a medic, so I don't know. But there isn't, ma majority of people who need glasses will be fine. Thank you. Um, it's personal, this one. Um, not in a bad way. Is there, any, <laughs> is there anything you wish you would have done before joining to get a better experience? Uh, no, well, the only thing I wish I'd done was I wish I'd I'd um, actually gone for the bursary route for university because I didn't really know if I wanted to do this when I was at university. Uh, so I kind of, now I know that if I was going to do it again, I know that I, I want to do this job and I want to be here. Um, I'd have got the Navy to pay for my for my studies, frankly, and not and not leave me below the student debt afterwards. Um, that's what I would have done. And kind of to sort of flip the question around slightly, I actually worked for 18 months as a Legionnaire's disease risk assessor when I left um, university. And it was a standard job for a company. You know, I was driving around in a van, uh, going to sites, assessing things. It was very repetitive, very dull. And it absolutely solidified the thought that I don't want to be doing this. I want to do something that challenges me more, that keeps, that keeps me moving, keeps me doing stuff, keeps me thinking and keeps presenting me with, a, with, a, with something to, um, to solve. Um, so I got some experience of a normal, normal job before I, before I joined. And, and, and I'm really glad I did. But I think if I was going around again, I would definitely get this pay for my university. <laughs> that would have been a better option. Uh, I think this next question is going to touch on more of the using the scholarship and the bursary. Um, sure. uh, it just it's a question of do you know anything about the scholarships in the Navy? Yeah, so um, there's only two areas that that really provide them. Um, that's engineering and medical, because we require degrees for our engineering officers. Um, if you want to. Uh, if you want to go to university, uh, then we'll do 15, it's £1,500 a year for sick form um, scholarships, uh, which will then roll you onto what's called uh, Defence STEM Undergraduate Scheme thesis, um, which will then take you to university. Uh, they'll pay your tuition fees and they'll give you four grand a year while you're at university. Um, and then 15 grand golden hello when you join. Um, so your training place is waiting for you when you finish your university studies. You can go to pretty much any university in the country as long as the degree is one of those that we've mentioned there on that slide. Um, so it's a fairly good deal. It's just started. Uh, they didn't do tuition fees until a couple of years ago, so they now are doing tuition fees as well. Uh, if you put it, Braun Navy Bursary into Google, you'll find it. It comes up really easily. I found a really good question. Hang on. Um... was personal preference what would you recommend would you rather do for this person an engineering degree or a physics degree if you could choose 
Uh, I kind of wish I'd done an, uh, an engineering degree now because I did physics because I did A levels of maths, physics, biology. I liked maths and physics. So I kind of went down to the physics route. Um, I found theoretical maths. I didn't really get it. At least if it was applied, I could have an understanding of what it was supposed to look, the outcome was supposed to look like. If I'd kind of thought about a new bit more about engineering, I probably would have done an electrical engineering degree instead. Um, but that's just learning as you go, I suppose. Brilliant. Um, what age were you when you joined the Navy? Uh, so I finished unit 21. I was about 22, 23. Um, you're by no means the youngest or the oldest at that point. There are uh, other branches like warfare and logistics don't require a degree. So you get guys coming in, guys and girls coming in at 18 for that. Uh, the, the oldest in my intake, I think, was a, a lady who was a who was a, a teacher um, in a previous job, and she joined at 30, 31. So, um, so that you really, you know, you're not you're not struggling if you're at that point. Uh, someone just touched. I suppose this is maybe in your remit. Um, what what's um, do you know the entry requirements for a warfare deck officer? Uh, so a warfare officer, um, so the guys who, guys and girls who drive the ships, who captain the ships, who are the principal warfare officers, you know, are sort of operators. They only need 96 UCAS points. Um, so that's what, three C's at A-level, I think. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, three C's at A-level. That's all they need for, uh, for and it doesn't have to be any specific subject, just non-overlapping. Um, within the Royal Navy, this, uh, Zach wants to know, he wants to do plumbing and the Navy, is there any way you could mix them up? Uh, if you want to do something that involves plumbing systems, then the marine engineers are exactly the place to be because our marine engineers look after, said so all of our sort of high pressure salt water systems that we use for firefighting, they look after all of our hot water systems, cold water systems, sanitary systems, um, ventilation systems, chilled water. So anything that looks after, that keeps my radar cool through venting or chilled water, the marine engineers provide all the kit for that. So, um, uh, that if you if you kind of want to go down the route of, of plumbing, then that's that's probably the one you're going to get the closest to. Well, um, one cadet, I suppose this is a lot of cadets asking this question as well. Planning to join the Royal Navy as a Marine Engineering Officer, but still in high school, and I've not picked my GCSEs yet. What would you advise? Um, it, to be honest, a GCSE level, it doesn't really matter as long as it's like it says there you get sort of you get at least five that are in the nine to four bracket and that your english language and maths are at a six so i think if 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 they i mean it's been a, it's been nearly 20 years since i did my gccs but at the, at the time i remember that in, things like english and maths and science were all compulsory anyway um it's more when you move on towards your a levels that just make sure you get things like maths and physics in there or or sort of btex and engineering that they're technical um because those maths and that physics will underpin a lot of your um a lot of your knowledge you'll need for your degree and later on so uh gcc's wise i wouldn't worry too much about it as long as you're doing the base ones that you need um <laughs> there you go here's one for an engineer how difficult is it to fix an engine uh i mean i'm gonna say it's really easy but i don't do it um my uh the, the marine engineers uh, are very good at what they do it's an incredibly complex beast um there uh yeah the gas turbine is is massive you know it's room sized it's not a it's not like a lawnmower engine or one in the front of your car you're talking the thing that's the size of a room um and they're very good at very quickly diagnosing the problem taking apart the right bits and fixing it and that's down to as, as i've kind of alluded to earlier a real layered system of of the technicians who know their bits inside out um and then the the managers above them uh, whether that's their more senior technicians or the officers who are helping to kind of pinpoint wider system issues uh, and make sure that and make sure the ship stays safe you know because if the engine's not working we don't we don't go anywhere uh, and you don't really floating around if you can help it um if you're on a, I said if you're on a submarine that's a nuclear reactor it's not a gas turbine um and that's a real really impressive piece of kit to spend your day looking after um uh, and you know, so the submariners that do that i think are, are, are pretty special people well um uh, uh, feeding through for some good questions let's have a look yeah, it's all right. Uh, have you got any advice on basic training, I suppose, for officer and rating? Yeah, ba basic training is not as difficult as you think it's going to be. Um, you are, it's encouraged, it's there to design to make you, to make you a bit tired, a bit cold, a bit wet, and then get you thinking. Because when we've all had a nice big meal, we've sat inside in the warm, we've sat on a comfy chair, we can all solve a problem. Um, it's just there to tie you out a little bit. It's just there to show you that, that it's not your brain quickly goes oh i'm a bit uncomfortable i don't like this 
but actually you can do it and it gets over it really quickly um uh, and it's fine um we're none of us are superhuman that is something like a 95 or 98 percent success rate so you're given all the tools you need to get through it they don't throw you in at the deep end you you slowly ease into it they do some training with you um teach you a few things and then and then put a little bit put it to test in a little bit you know somewhere and then do a bit more training test that bit and then they'll put you on a bit of an exercise three days to bring it all together so you're by no means thrown in at deep end um and as i said 98 percent of people pass so the odds are very much in your favor um, can you just on the slides go back to the weapons engineer role for someone? There you are. So, how different is officer training to recruit training? Uh, longer. Um, so, so recruits typically at rally where they go for their basic training phase one, as we would call it. Their phase one is about eight weeks, and it's the basics of. Um, uh, kind of marching sort of how to do the drill how to look after uniform how to study stuff how to be the, the basic discipline stuff and, and the slight marinization uh, as an officer our initial training phase one is two terms so two school terms so if you join in the you know in the january you'll be finished by sort of august um for example i started in may so i was done by sort of christmas time um ours is much more uh it does all the same stuff in terms of marching discipline you know leadership fitness etc but it also does um leadership development um sort of how to how to do tactical development how to do tactical planning you know we take the boats out on the river and and do little task groups and, and do missions and conduct sort of um, operational estimates tactical estimates and, and try to understand how to how to coordinate so ours is longer um but then when you then get to your specialist training, which is called phase two, so whichever branch you decide to be, where they teach you to be that thing, um, the ratings, for example, for their engineering training is much longer and much more broken down um, than ours as officers, officer engineers. So the ratings will be doing a bit, going to see, consolidating it, coming back again, doing a bit more, going back to see again over a course of about 18 months or two years. Ours is a much quicker canter through because we've got the degree. So we should have the theory there already. It's just applying it to the, to the maritime environment. And then going away and looking at a bit at sea and, and sort of coming out the other end, ready to go and run a department. Um, so it really depends on, on what you want to do. Some some crews, submariners take longer to train because they have to do the submarine course as well. Um, because when they're underwater, no one's coming. No one's coming. They've got to do it themselves. Um, uh, so it, it very much depends. But ours has a lot more tactical stuff in it than the ratings do. But, but their phase two specialist training is longer because they're, they're deeper experts than we are. That's not much of an answer, sorry. <laughs> Um, I suppose if you touch on the officers, then how many members in a range are you, like crew members, are you in charge of? So uh, when I joined Diamond as, as the one of the um, engineering officers, uh, there was a head of department um, who was a lieutenant commander. His plan, his concern was long-term vision. He was running about three, six months down the line. There was two of us as lieutenants. Um, and between us, we had a department of about 50 or 60 to look after. So I was kind of in charge of all the communication systems and stuff like that, networks um, and navigation systems and that sort of thing. And my opposite number was in charge of weapon systems, um, uh, combat systems and that type of stuff. And then you swap over halfway through. So um, we had about, we had between us about 60, so 30 odd each at a time, of which some of those might have, um, you know, 20 years experience. And I'm there on week one, day one, and they're going, boss, what are we doing? And I'm going, I don't know, I've just got it. Um, and then we try and work it out between us. So um, it's a very, very symbiotic, very good relationship. Thank you. Uh, the, the few questions have come to the same one. Yeah, sorry. If, if you're going back on deployment, what would the what's the best country you've been to, and if you could choose, where would you go? Uh, oh, the states was was fantastic. So we were based out of Florida for part of it, and then we we're out of New York and into New York for a bit, and then up, then Norfolk, Virginia. Um, I got I got taken I got flown off for a meeting in Washington I had to go to so I spent a couple of days in Washington DC because I needed two days before they could fly me back I was only there for one one meeting so a bit of bit of uh, holiday there uh, and I went to Chicago because I had three days off at Thanksgiving so um, I think the states was the best place I've been where else would I like to go I've not done a Caribbean deployment yet uh, I think the Caribbean would be quite a nice place to spend a few months um, I, I've been around a few places in Europe with NATO for different things such as uh, Holland and, and Romania and places like that which were, which were really interesting too but. I think if I could do another, my next, if my next, if I could do another deployment somewhere else, um, I think it's got to be probably the Caribbean. That'd be that'd be nice. Um, were you in the Sea Cadets when you were younger? 
I wasn't, no. No, I've got no sort of military background or anything like that. My parents aren't military. I grew up in Suffolk, so I grew up in the middle of loads of air bases. Um, so how I'm not in the Air Force, I've got no idea. Um, I'm glad I'm, I'm glad I've done this because um, I think we do we do a lot more all the time. You know, when there's not not a conflict on, we're, we're still out at sea. We're still out protecting all the stuff I talked about earlier. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it just I looked at I kind of looked at all three. Was got interested in all the Navy, grabbed my attention, and never really went away. Well, we normally get this question a lot as well. Do you do you happen to have the Scottish version of the calls? Yeah, not to hand. Um, I can help with that. I'm from Scotland. So your GCSEs are your National 5 qualifications. Brilliant. I mean, Sam, I'm not from Scotland, so I have no idea myself. <laughs> I, yeah, I, to be honest, if I get asked, I normally have to just find a table somewhere and, and do a comparison. Um, um, give me a sec. You just typing that in, Amy? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll I'll find another question while you're typing up. Um, is a maths A level is is maths at A level a requirement for marine engineering? Uh, yes, broadly, yes, it is. So, um, as a uh, if you want to go marine engineer for the apprentice, um depends what you want to do so if you want to be an engineering technician start at the bottom then there's no requirements for any a levels if you want to do a levels and you want to go the accelerated apprentice it needs to be maths and another stem if you're doing a levels um and if you want to go the officer route you need to have that maths a level in there as well um and to be honest most engineering or uh, universities will want you to have done maths at a level anyway because it'll underpin a lot of what you've what you're going to do in your degree level anyway so um, maths is a very core cool part of engineering. So unless you're going to come in as the uh, engineering technician and start at the sort of the very bottom end, you, you'll need to have done a maths level. Um, okay, happy with that. Um, someone's asked the question now. To be fair, it's a convoluted question, but I'm quite interested as well. Is there a head of the weapons engineering branch for the Royal Navy, like overall? Yeah, so we actually have a, uh, yeah, sort of. We have what's called Chief Naval Engineering Officer who oversees the entirety of the engineering cadet. So they are an admiral, rear admiral, I think rightly. Um, uh, and they they are, they oversee all of the, the kind of each branch. We, we have got a, we'll then have a, a, a Commodore head of branch. Um, but it very much depends on what sort of part of that stream down you're looking. So you know, personnel then gets people to manage that. Um, uh, if you're looking at sort of future careers, there's other people who can't do bits and pieces like that. Um, but broadly, yeah, the chief naval engineering officer is where we kind of aim to as a as a, as a pure engineering sort of uh, senior individual. And then after that, um, the highest we go then is second sea lord. So uh, vice admiral is the, is the highest an engineer can make uh, make in the navy. So second second job from the top. Okay, where are we? what happens if you're over 39 and you still want to be an engineer um it can be wavered so if you've got everything you need um and we need those people and we need engineers you know it's not just a um uh it's not just a uh a navy problem it's a national problem the, the country recognizes it's short on engineers so whatever if you if you want to go and do engineering whatever you want to go and do with it you will find a job somewhere because the whole country needs more engineers and so do we that's why for naval for engineering officers for example there's if you just join after you finish your degree there's a twenty seven thousand pound sort of golden hello just for turning up so um that's how desperate we are to, we're throwing that sort of money at the problem there's quite a few there. I think we must have a few commanding officers and sea cadets asking to get back in. <laughs> if it's over thirty nine, you've got you've got everything you need. They'll look to they'll try and look to waiver it. Um, if we and, and we we normally need weapon engineers um, more than we need anyone else. Um, we normally need a few more MEs most years, marine engineers, um, air engineering. For some reason is always really popular. We don't take that many. We're only about fourteen a year compared to sort of uh, maybe fifty of the other two each a year. So. Um, so, uh, and everyone wants to work with aircraft for some reason. So, um, 
that's always a really popular choice. Um, I've got a few cadets here saying there's GCSE engineering. Would, would you think that would help them? Um, again, I, I don't think you need to get too hung up over your engine, over your GCSEs, um, but I think it would uh, it would give you a good grounding as you move forward. If, you, if you're interested in it, do it, because trying to study something you're not interested in is hard work. Um, and as I kind of alluded to earlier, if you're interested in engineering and you want to move forward with it, um, do it because the nation needs engineers um, and you'll never be short of finding somewhere to work. Um, how long for the accelerated apprentice on the bottom of the PowerPoint, how long is the training from beginning to end for them? So it's kind of a, it's kind of a consistent drip feed. So your, um, your first uh, sort of your rally time is said earlier, sort of about, about eight weeks. Um, and then you're down to, to, either Collingwood or Sultan, which is down this way near uh, near Portsmouth. So HMS Collingwood in Fairham or HMS Sultan in um, in Gosport. Um, and from there, you'll kind of do around 18 months, two years between learning some theory, taking it to a ship and testing it and, and doing the sort of practical application, coming back, doing a bit more theory and going backwards and forwards like that. So sort of within two-ish years of joining, you'll be fully fledged um, uh, apprentice technician. Um, and then you'll you work your way through so as you go through your um, through your training, you go through some NVQs. I think it's two and three, and then you end up with a foundation degree. By the time you sort of finish everything and get tied up, ready to become a petty officer, um, so within two three years of joining, you'll have had, you'll get yourself a foundation degree, and that's a point there actually where if you decide maybe the university route isn't for you, but you quite like the sound of the officer officer job, but you don't necessarily want to go to university. A lot of people will now will join as an accelerated apprentice, go through those two three years, get their foundation degree. So they'll be what twenty twenty one ish 22 maybe by the time they finish their foundation degree um their petty officers qualifying course gives them that they'll then um request to go officer take the officer selection process same as they would have done if they if they'd done the degree they'll then go to Portsmouth university and do a year at university fully paid to finish their degree and then come across to my side of the of the fence as a as an engineering officer so that's more the apprentice route through to officer if you don't want to go and do three years of peer study at university um, can you go onto the marine engineer slide just for us? Yeah, sure. Let's have a look at that one. Someone's asking, do you have to go to university if you're interested in the Navy, even if you're in the sea cadets? No, you don't have to go to university. Um, the only places that require a degree are the medical branch uh, for officers um, or the for majority of us, you know, things like doctors, you know, the stuff you would expect them to have for in a civilian world anyway. Um, and then engineering officers, um, for a direct entry route as i just said if you wanted to join as an apprentice do that training a bit slower and do it hands-on and build up to foundation foundation degree and then apply to come across to my side of the fence as an engineering officer you can do that um and then you just sit the admiralty interview process um and and you'll do your final year of your degree at portsmouth and then you'll um you'll you'll, you'll commission across to my side and be a, be a manager instead of a hands-on technician cool. um why did you want to be an engineer uh because i'm probably just curious about things um i like the i like the kind of technical side i think mean, yeah having, having studied physics i was always quite interested in how things worked and um, that was obviously on a much larger scale or smaller scale depending which end of that you go um but i also thought the title, title weapon engineer sounded quite cool so i quite like that as well that's why i'm, I'm a weapon engineer and not not a marine engineer but um more with my background of, of physics the you know radar propagation communications propagation sort of all the kind of um, electromagnetic spectrum stuff fit me really well as opposed to sort of gas turbines diesel generators which are a bit more heavy mechanical and not really my my area of interest or expertise uh, a lot of questions are the same ones here um a lot of cadets are doing btex in college does that cross across like come across absolutely yeah yeah btex are fine because um they still accrue ucas points and um what they do is provide you a bit more of a uh hands-on uh, uh, applied sort of experience more so than you might get from just doing maths and physics at a levels for example so btex as long as it accrues ucas points then it, it, it's absolutely fine cool. uh, and someone's asking for the requirements of the accelerated apprentice we can Do we go back to that one go back to that one for us yeah <laughs> Real. Uh, i'm not sure if we've answered this one um Unless we have. Uh, why did you want to join the Navy? Uh, I finished university and the idea of doing the same job for 40 years, you know, moving the same piece of paper left to right, mate, uh, didn't didn't appeal. 
I didn't, as I found out with my 18 months in my a previous job as a risk assessor, I didn't enjoy making money for someone else. It didn't drive me. I wanted to do something that I felt like it mattered, um, that felt like I was doing something that was important. Um, and I kind of narrowed down between the police force and I looked at teaching for a little while, but I don't think I would have had a long-term interest. Um, I, so I looked at the kind of, the, I narrowed down sort of things like the police force and the military, um, kind of settled on the military, looked at all three services, considered the air force, didn't really click with that, considered the army, didn't, didn't, again, didn't, looked okay. I've probably been an engineer there as well, but the Navy, something about the Navy, about the ability to travel, um, the ability to kind of go and see the world and, and, and experience stuff isolated at sea and happily responsible for those sort of decisions uh, where there's no one coming to help was a bit that kind of really attracted me to it. Um, and and I'm obviously made the right choice because I'm still here. Uh, and we'll finish on this final question for the the getting into being an officer to get the, the university bursary. They're asking how high your grades need to be. I presume it's going to be what's the process for you getting a new the, the university bursary? Yeah, so if you're in if you're doing your A levels now, whichever year you're in, you can apply first for the for the A level scholarship, which will if you're in your first year now, it'll backdate to your first year whenever you've applied. Um, you just got to go and just there's a if you put Royal Navy bursary in be an application sort of process if there was a box to tick for the bursary that will then take you through the standard application application process that the rest of us have all done everyone else will do you'll go and sit your your interview um or various interviews with your with your careers um advisors um and as you go through you'll sit what's called the what the Admiralty interview board officer selection board where they do sort of talk about you about team where you've done teamwork where you've led a team where you've, you've shown communication skills all this type of stuff it's 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 not as intimidating as it sounds it's all about you um, and you're the best person that knows about you. So, you know, you're the world expert. Um, and you kind of deliver those sorts of um, discussions and you talk to people and you do kind of a, a group exercise where you talk about problem solving and all that. Once you've done all that, you've, you've passed, um, you're then selected for, uh, you're, you've got a training place waiting for you whenever you finish your education, you know, finish your A-levels, finish your degree, and then they'll, they'll provide you with the funding for your, um, for your uh, A-levels will then roll on to the bursary when you get to university. So people will keep in touch with you and help you through the process. You basically, as long as you've got um, sort of the similar sort of grades there on the officer GCSEs part, um, I think it might actually be English language and maths at a seven for a bursary, but, but a six will be, would also be acceptable. Um, that could be, that can be dealt with. That's not a problem. And then they just want you to, to achieve your A-levels and get to university and study the right degree at the place of your choosing. Thank you. Um, that's all the questions as well. There's many questions today as well. Um, thank you, Adam.